good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to Shoals Marine Laboratory's Brown Bag Style Seminar, or officially referred to as our Rock Talk Seminar. Um, I'm David Buck, the Associate Director of the Lab. For those of you that are not familiar with uh, Shoals Marine Lab or are joining us from afar, um, SML is the largest and oldest undergraduate-focused marine lab in the country. Uh, the lab is jointly operated by the University of New Hampshire um, and Cornell University. <clears throat> the lab is located in the southern part of the Gulf of Maine within the Isles of Shoals, a group of islands located approximately six, six miles off the Maine, New Hampshire coast. The Rock Talk series provides an opportunity for SML, um, our students, our faculty, our staff, researchers, and our wider community to come together for a seminar style lecture on current and emerging issues in marine science. Uh, this summer, as with last summer, our Rock Talk seminars are evolving a bit with the COVID landscape, and we're doing them virtually, but we also are fortunate enough to have students on the island. Um, three courses are with us on island tonight, uh, our ecology and the marine environment course, field animal behavior, and integrated ecosystem research and management. In addition, our marine mammal biology course, which is running as an online course this summer, is also with us this evening. Uh, so I'm happy to welcome the students, faculty, SML staff, and other SML community members that are joining us this evening. Um, so the format for tonight's Rock Talk will be a approximately 45 minute uh, PowerPoint presentation followed by 15 minutes of question and answer. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, I would direct you to the Q&A box, which you'll, which you'll find kind of down on the lower toolbar in your sort of Zoom window. Um, so please use that Q&A box to type in your questions, and um, I will help facilitate the Q&A period at the end. Also, if you're having any sort of technical difficulties during the course of the seminar, please use those to, to uh, ask questions of either myself or one of our other staff members, and we'll do our best to help you out. So this evening, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Catherine Mills uh, with us. Uh, Dr. Mills is a research scientist at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, which is located just up the coast in Portland, Maine. Uh, she earned her PhD in natural resources from Cornell University. Um, and as a quantitative fisheries ecologist, Kathy studies marine ecosystem changes and fish ecosystem fishery relationships with a focus on the Gulf of Maine and the Northeast US shelf regions. Specifically, her research investigates how physical and ecosystem conditions are changing, how these changes affect uh, fish populations, biological communities, and marine fisheries, and then also how fisheries and fishing communities can effectively respond to these changes. So her talk tonight will discuss the recent warming of ocean waters here in the Northwest Atlantic, particularly in the Gulf of Maine, <clears throat> and how species distributions are responding to these changes. She will describe the impacts of these changes on local fishing communities and how they are and aren't set up to adapt to the concurrent declines in traditional fish and traditionally fish species and the relatively recent arrival of new commercially viable species. So we're very fortunate to have Dr. Mills participate in this evening's Rock Talk. Uh, please join me in welcoming her. Uh, so, Kathy, I will pass the virtual Zoom mic to you. Thank you very much for being here tonight. All right, thank you. It's great to be here with all of you. Um, I only wish I could actually be out on shoals uh, in person, but maybe next year there will be good opportunities for that. So, I am going to share my screen. Great. Well, um, yeah, it's great to be with you. I'm going to be walking you through, um, you know, changes across the Gulf of Maine and Northeast Shelf ecosystem tonight. So going from physical changes in ocean conditions through biological changes and into the human system as well in terms of how those biological changes interact with and affect fisheries in the region. So the outline will highlight those three points. I'll start by sharing a bit about warming on the Northeast Shelf the impact that is having for species and fisheries, and then move a bit into uh, how we're thinking about climate vulnerabilities and adaptation for fisheries in the region. So just to start with the sort of uh, physical state of the system, the Northeast Shelf and the Gulf of Maine have both been warming extremely rapidly 
since we began gathering satellite sea surface temperature data um, back in 1982, we've seen this region warm about three times faster than the average warming rate across the world's oceans. In the past 15 years, which is sort of more relevant to the ecosystem and how it adjusts to conditions, we've been warming about five times faster here than the global average. So we're experiencing really exceptional warming rates and long-term warming trends in this region. Um, what this looks like in a different view is everything shown here in this map, and you see the Northeast US right here along this section, everything in yellow um, represents the pixel of the globe that stands above the 95th percentile in terms of warming rates. Um, so you see really rapid warming rates across this whole section of the Northwest Atlantic uh, and up into the Labrador Sea and around the Arctic as well. So this area is warming really rapidly based on the observations we have to date. And as we look to the future, many of the climate projections also indicate we'll continue warming exceptionally rapidly in the future as well. So this would be the Northeast US region right here. Um, but not only are we um, grappling with and the ecosystem is experiencing a really rapid warming trend, we're also seeing changes in temperature emerge in different ways as well. So um, seasonality and the, the timing of warming and cooling and the effects that that has on the annual cycle of temperature is also changing. So in this region, we've been warming up earlier and cooling down later in the year, more recently than we had been in the past. In the Gulf of Maine, this has actually caused the length of what feels like summer to expand by about two days per year since 1982. So it feels like summer and the duration of that summer-like period has gotten substantially longer in the Gulf of Maine. It's been increasing and expanding by about point, a half a day a year in the mid-Atlantic. Um, so quite a contrast in those experiences right here just in the Northeast US region itself. And we've also been experiencing more frequent marine heat waves. So we define a heat wave as a period of five or more consecutive days where the ocean temperature is at or above the 90th percentile for temperatures that had previously been observed in that spot on that day in the past. So a heat wave really stands out from the historical climatological pattern. And we actually first coined this term right here in the region. So we first applied the term heat wave to the ocean here in the Northwest Atlantic in 2012 when we experienced this really large um, heat wave event that affected the Northwest Atlantic from Cape Hatteras all the way up through the Gulf of Maine into the Labrador Sea and over to Iceland. And during the summer of 2012 in this region, we were running about two to three degrees warmer than the long-term average. Um, in terms of sea surface temperatures. And since that time, we've been experiencing more frequent marine heat waves. So we track these um, in this plot by looking at, you know, years as you come up the y-axis, and then um, the actual temperature anomalies plotted in color in the background, but the black bars represent a day when we would have said we were in heat wave status for, for the region. And so you can see here in 2012, we were in heat wave status for nearly the whole year. And you can also see that after 2012, there's been a lot more black. So we had repeated heat wave events in 2016, 2018, 2020. And right now in 2021, we've been in heat wave status for most of the start of this year or the first half of this year. So these temperature changes all have ramifications for biological processes and for the species that live in the ecosystem and how they function, how they interact with one another as well. So we've seen changes not only here, but across many marine ecoregions uh, in terms of spatial distribution of fish species, um, particularly species moving poleward and to deeper waters as waters warm and they attempt to track cooler temperatures. We're also seeing changes in population productivity because warming temperatures can affect things like um, their growth rates, their reproductive and uh, recruitment success, their mortality levels um, as well. 
And productivity interacts with distribution because you may sort of have conditions that are unfavorable to a species in a certain portion of its range and then see as a result of declining productivity in that area an apparent distribution shift as the population becomes more prevalent in a different portion of its range. And the changes also affect timing of life history events like spawning timing or for diadromous fish, the run timing when they migrate back into rivers. Um, and it affects interactions between species too as some species respond more quickly uh, to temperature changes or other ocean um, condition changes than others, it may alter the species that are present together to interact with one another. So these are just a few examples. I'm gonna really dig in to tell you more about distribution and productivity shifts in some of my subsequent slides. So as I mentioned, many species are moving poleward and to deeper depths. This is one example from the Northeast Shelf where we're showing silver hake back in the spring survey, the um, federal bottom trawl survey that's conducted in the offshore waters here, um, showing that silver hake was really picked up along the shelf break um, off of Long Island in that region in the you know, 60s and early 70s. Now, in more recent years, we're really seeing silver hake concentrated in the Gulf of Maine. So there's been a substantial shift um, from the mid-Atlantic into the Gulf of Maine. And this is common across a number of species in this region. Um, we are seeing a variety of mid-Atlantic species now appearing in the Gulf of Maine where um, some of them used to be sort of observances that would, are, they were just rare occurrences and unusual sightings. And now they're becoming much more common. So black sea bass, which is traditionally um, has been distributed further south and is, you know, a common species caught in fisheries in Rhode Island, New York, that area, is now appearing in the Gulf of Maine in um, showing up in lobster traps here and also just in other fisheries as well. And longfin squid is an interesting example um, that particularly factored into the 2012 heat wave. So um, we do see longfin squid here in the Gulf of Maine, but they tend to be quite ephemeral. So they'll show up and then disappear, move back to the offshore waters. Um, and in 2012, they moved in to the Gulf of Maine's coastal waters and stayed there throughout the course of the summer. And there was actually a fishery that arose just during that summer to target the squid because they were so reliably present and in fairly high abundances. And in response to shifting distributions of the fish themselves, we're also seeing fisheries change where they're catching these fish. So the the vessels and the operators are shifting where they're fishing. This shows the um, in black the survey catch of summer flounder over time, and you can see that the where the fish has been seen has trended uh, northward, and then the um, the green line shows where summer flounder has been caught in our commercial fisheries, and you can also see that trending northward as well. And essentially, what this looks like is that. In the late 90s, the fishery for summer flounder was concentrated off of North Carolina and the Chesapeake Bay. But by the late 2010s, it was more concentrated off of Long Island Sound and New Jersey. So um, I guess the next sort of biological effect that's really prevalent in many of the responses that we're seeing to warming and other um, ecosystem changes is shifts in population productivity. And so we are already seeing this play out for a number of our commercially important species in this region. We've seen declines in Gulf of Maine cod and northern shrimp that can both be attributed to temperature. And I'll go into the cod example in just a bit in more depth. And I'll also talk about lobster in more depth because it's a really interesting story of contrasting responses in Southern New England versus Gulf of Maine populations. So for Gulf of Maine cod, um, we had, there had been, you know, real optimism in the stock assessments that the Gulf of Maine cod stock was recovering after a period of overfishing and was finally coming back to relatively high population levels. So there was hope that the population was actually bouncing back and we would see, you know, productive stocks that could be fished more in this region. And and then a subsequent assessment to the good news assessment revealed that no, actually the population was much worse off than had previously been expected. 
um, you see this particular downturn here in the spawning stock biomass and also in the recruitment of young cod to the stock um, occurring you know, during this time period from 2005 through 2014. And what we did with this, um, with an analysis of this pattern was try to understand what might be happening here and, you know, what is, what is behind this change. And so typically in fishery science, we assume that recruits of young fish come from the spawning stock, the, the number of older fish that are there to produce the young fish. So typically we rely on a really strong relationship between spawning stock biomass and recruitment to determine how many fish we can expect to be contributed to the population in subsequent years. When we looked at, uh, we created a model essentially of that spawning stock um, recruitment relationship to um, 2004 and projected it forward just based on spawning stock to see what recruitment we would expect. And with only spawning stock biomass, we still saw that we were expecting the population and the recruitment levels from that population to be doing better than was actually observed um, in reality. But when we added temperature into this model, we saw that the projected um, recruitment for the population declined and fit the pattern that had been observed uh, much more tightly. And so this indicates that temperature is playing a key role in altering the productivity of the Gulf of Maine cod stock. And this was something that uh, was not picked up on right away in the stock assessment and fishery management process. So uh, it hadn't really been detected that temperature may be causing a downturn in productivity. So there wasn't an expectation that we needed to perhaps be more precautionary in our fishing levels on that stock. When we project this forward, uh, we were working for that model in the observation period, but when we looked beyond that and projected it forward to the future based on um, potential temperature scenarios, what we saw is that with no fishing, under modest warming levels, we could expect the Gulf of Maine cod stock to recover, but at very high warming levels, we wouldn't expect to see this population achieve a, a spawning stock biomass level that would put it into um, a level where fishing could be supported and sustained on that stock. And really, the future of cod in the Gulf of Maine depends on both fishing pressure and temperature because I'm showing you this result with no fishing on the stock. Whereas if you start applying fishing pressure um, at even relatively modest levels, you soon reach a point where even under these uh, lower warming conditions, the population would no longer reach this recovery threshold. So warming um, in the Gulf of Maine affected recruitment of the cod stock here. Um, it also affected mortality and growth, which I didn't touch on in that example. Um, by not accounting for the effects of warming, management really struggled to kind of keep up with the changes in the stock. It continued setting quotas too high for several years. And overfishing on the stock was occurring even when the industry was following the rules and when the managers thought they had set the rules appropriately. So this affects things like the harvest levels that should be expected from the stock, the rebuilding targets that are realistic, and the timelines for recovery of the stock. Um, a lobster is also another really interesting example and one that's particularly important here in Maine and New Hampshire. It's the, it has been the single, um, the most valuable single species fishery in the U.S. since 2014. It accounts for about 88% of New Hampshire's uh, landed value from all marine fisheries and about 80, actually I think this number is more like 85% for the most recent year. Um, so it's really important to our fisheries here and in Maine in particular, as you move further down east to the general economy of many of the fishing communities, which are still very resource dependent. So American lobster has really interesting um, pattern when you look at its two populations in the Northeast. There's a Gulf of Maine population and a Southern New England population that are um, somewhat distinct and are treated separately in how we manage this species. Um, so the Gulf of Maine cod, or, sorry, lobster population has been increasing in recent years, particularly uh, since 2005. The Southern New England population, however, has been declining since the late 1990s. And 
we tried to understand the influence of temperature and a number of other factors on these changes. And we looked at these effects by assuming that what if they weren't there? So in this case, we're looking at temperature and saying for the actual temperatures, would we expect to see the stock sort of uh, trajectory play out as it has? And what if we had experienced the average temperatures over the historical time period going back to 1982? So how would the long-term average temperature effects relate to the temperatures that were actually experienced in any given year. And when we did this, what we saw is that in the Gulf of Maine, the warmer than typical or the warmer than average temperatures have really aligned with the growth of the stock. So the warming of the Gulf of Maine has actually enhanced the productivity of the lobster population here. And it, this is also tied to recruitment. So it enabled the young lobsters to survive better and to uh, grow and reproduce themselves. And this is really contributed. It's sort of the temperatures in the Gulf of Maine have really come into a very sweet spot for production of lobsters. So we see that pattern in the Gulf of Maine. In contrast, in southern New England, what we see here in blue are the, project, or the uh, trajectory of the stock we would expect under the, under the actual temperatures. And that parallel the decline, there is much more of a gap here, and this is related to some of the other factors at play in southern New England, like um, shell disease and some other, um, other factors I'm not showing you here. Whereas if we had only experienced the long-term average temperature conditions in southern New England, we would have expected the stock to follow the tan trajectory and to be at quite substantially higher levels um, under those average conditions. So temperatures in southern New England have exceeded a threshold that's really conducive to lobster po uh, the lobster po population's productivity. And it's also really interesting, I'm just going to throw in here something that's not ecosystem related, but is related to the fishery. In the Gulf of Maine, um, the, there has been a conservation measure in place here for over a century to protect large female or to protect um, spawning female lobsters as well as large lobsters. By protecting the large and the uh, fecund females, the ones that are at a size where they're reproducing and contributing to the population, we've only enhanced the benefits of the warming that we have experienced. So this conservation measure, if we had fished on those large female lobsters in the Gulf of Maine, we would expect the population to be here. Instead, it's substantially higher along the blue trajectory. And so those conservation measures added a boost to the actual trajectory of the stock. Whereas in southern New England, had they had this, a similar measure in place, again, we would have expected the stock to be doing better than where it would be projected to be under um, just the temperature change alone. When we play this out into the future by, again, assuming certain temperature um, conditions or uh, several different temperature scenarios, what we see is that we do expect a gradual long-term decline in the abundance of the Gulf of Maine population. And again, this parallel southern New England where we expect we'll have temperatures moving into a zone that's not necessarily as conducive for such high productivity of lobsters. In southern New England, under certain conditions, if temperature is the only driver, we would expect to see some recovery of that stock. And um, again, I'm only isolating this one driver, but uh, it gives some hope for future uh, bit of a recovery from current levels in that area. And then finally, I want to talk about some of our work relating these changes to what they might mean for fisheries in the future and starting to think about climate adaptation. So one first point uh, to address is what is adaptation? So Adaptation is really um, trying to um, identify ways of buffering negative impacts that might be created by climate change or identifying new opportunities that might arise um, because of some of the changes that are occurring. And adaptation is really a matter of thinking about decisions that are being made and how climate ready they are, or building climate preparedness into those decisions. Hang on one second. So there are decisions being made at many levels that could be influenced by some of the climate impacts that we are seeing. 
for individual fishermen, for example, they may decide, they may face a decision about whether they stay in a fishing area they typically fished or whether they travel further and go to a new area as we saw in the summer flounder example uh, several slides ago. For a community, uh, they may need to think about their waterfront infrastructure and how it might be resilient to climate change or whether it's prepared to accommodate some of the changes that may be coming, whether those are related to sea level rise, but also to changes in species availability and how that might affect the types of fisheries that are being um, that are ongoing in their communities. And then in management, a number of considerations come into place. So thinking about um, the harvest levels and the population trajectory expectations, what those might look like in the future and how stocks can be managed um, appropriately given some of the climate influences that are shaping them. And also it plays into fishery management from the perspective of access and allocation of fishing rights, um, rights to harvest the fish through quotas or permits um, or licenses that fishermen have to have to participate in certain fisheries. So having systems that can be flexible to changes as they're occurring on the water because of climate change um, is an important role that takes place within the fishery management system as well. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our work around fishing community vulnerability assessment and adaptation planning. In this work, we have focused on a few different questions. The first being, how will um, how do we expect fishing communities to be affected by changes in species availability? So really focused on warming and what that means for shifts in species and what those shifts in species might mean for communities uh, as they're currently engaged in fisheries. The next question is which adaptation strategies might be of interest to fishermen and fishing communities looking beyond just the harvesters themselves. And finally, what strategies might be most effective for buffering impacts associated with shifting species. So for the first question, we have applied a social ecological vulnerability assessment framework that brings together considerations of change in the ecological system how those intersect with the social system and the ability of the social system to respond to those changes. So in this work, we're looking at um, one climate scenario, the RCP 8.5 scenario, which is a high emissions business as usual um, scenario with the CMIT 5 climate uh, model ensemble. And then we're projecting these changes out to 2055. So, and we're doing this at a spatial scale that is relevant to the community. So we identify community areas based on where they're currently fishing in the ocean. And I'll reiterate this in just a moment. Um, but one of our one of the first questions we need to address in this assessment framework is understanding how species availability will change for a particular community. So this involves understanding what climate conditions will look like, how sensitive the species are to those conditions, and then looking at what that might mean for species change at a local level. So we do this by pulling together information on the expected um, vulnerability of the species, but then integrating that into uh, species distribution models that are driven by temperature. So we can look at where species are now and then assume that the temperature changes in a certain way that's con consistent with the climate projections for the future, and then look at the difference between the future projections and the current um, baseline uh, distribution of the species to understand how we expect those distributions to change in the future. So this is just one example for lobster in the spring and fall. What you can see here are the baseline models, then if we change the temperature to be consistent with the 2055 temperatures from the RCP 8.5 scenario, this is what the lobster distribution will look like. And it's much more helpful to see the differences when you take the difference between those two maps and can generate um, just a depiction of change. So this is just one example. I'll just talk through the fall um, projected shift in biomass. And what we see here, the purples indicate decline. And so we are projecting declines in uh, American lobster along the southern coast of the Gulf of Maine and on um, Georgia's bank, and then also along the northeast shelf to the mid-Atlantic. But when you see a little bit of pink here, indicating a projected increase in the uh, biomass of 
lobster in the future from sort of mid coast to down east Maine into the Bay of Fundy and around to the tip of the Scotian Shelf. So we can um, give you a sense of the overall change in the distribution of one species, but to really understand how this intersects with fisheries, we need to understand what this looks like across many species. So we have played this out for about 50 species that are routinely present along the Northeast Shelf. And I'm not gonna walk through this in detail, um, but I, I, I cited here the paper it comes from if you want to dig into all the details. But really what you generally see is that we are expecting declines across the board and some of the groundfish species that are really important to fisheries in this region now. And what we see is that for some of the species, uh, particularly the coastal species and some of the elasma branks, we're expecting to see real increases in the future in the Gulf of Maine and only sort of modest change in the mid-Atlantic. So many of these species that are currently mid-Atlantic species won't necessarily disappear from that region. So they will likely have conditions that are conducive to them moving into the Gulf of Maine and becoming more abundant and prevalent here. So then the next question is, how does this play out at a local community level? And this relates, to understand this, we have to think about the sensitivity of the community to those changes. And so sensitivity to those changes involves understanding really what their fisheries are dependent on now in terms of which species they rely on for the harvest that they are um, that they are gathering in the fisheries. So we look at sensitivity based on, for each fishing community, where are they fishing and what are they catching? So this is the Portland fishing footprint. And we construct this from vessel trip report data about where they caught the fish that they bring back to Portland to land. And so for each, uh, we do this work for about 120 communities from Maine down to North Carolina. For each community, we can construct a locally relevant footprint from which we can extract an assessment of the changes in species um, from the species models I just showed you. And then we can apply those changes to what's being caught in or landed in a particular port by their fisheries. So I'm gonna show you two examples, one from Point Judith, um, Rhode Island, and one from Portland um, to indicate some of the contrast that we see in these results. So the plots generally are showing some of the top species that are currently landed in each port. So in Point Judith, you see a mix of maybe the top 12 species that are currently being landed in that port. The blues indicate projected declines for those species in the future. The oranges and pinks indicate projected increases. So in Point Judith, we have a real mix of responses among the species they're currently relying on in their fisheries with lobster, some of the ground fish and herring projected to decline. But many other species like scup, longfin squid, and summer flounder projected to increase in the future. Unfortunately, this isn't consistently the pattern across the region. So in Portland, we see a lot more blue, a lot more blue indicating declines in the species that the um, fisheries here are currently dependent upon. And when we play this out across all the communities that we've evaluated, this is just showing the communities oriented from north to south, what we see is generally north of Cape Cod, um, much stronger projected declines in the species that they're currently dependent on, whereas that effect or the outcome is buffered substantially south of Cape Cod. And um, yeah, I'll just add a little bit here, or well, I'll come back to this um, in just a couple of slides. So essentially remember, you know, stronger declines north of Cape Cod than south. So the last question is whether the community has the ability to adapt to those changes. And this also varies across the region and where we'll tie together this north-south difference. Um, north of Cape Cod, we also generally see communities showing um, signs or the projections indicate that there will be new opportunities created by species that are moving into that area, but not currently part of what is being fished. Whereas uh, in other communities like Point Judith, we have very limited number of what we call emerging species, those that are becoming more, um, more prevalent and maybe fishable in the future. And so when, again, we play this out across all the communities, you see larger numbers of emerging species north of Cape Cod, which is the dashed line here, and smaller numbers south. So that indicates that the impacts are likely to be stronger in the north 
But the potential opportunities, if you could capitalize on these emerging species and if they actually become economically viable, could be greater. But um, adapt, adaptive capacity also depends on not only what might be available, but also the capacity to react to that option. And that has, you know, connections to just general social conditions in these communities. So to bring that into our considerations, we look at a suite of social indicators that have been developed by uh, NOAA, and particularly one of our collaborators has led this effort within NOAA, to think about indicators that reflect social vulnerability, um, other forms of community vulnerability that might affect the ability to respond and actually adapt to changes as they occur. When we put this all together, um, it helps us to understand where we might sort of prioritize and focus efforts on supporting adaptation for fishing communities in the future. So in this figure, I've oriented the communities that we have evaluated based on the percent change in relative biomass of the species that they are currently harvesting in their fisheries, the, the mix of species as a whole, relative to their mean social vulnerability or their um, adaptive capacity. And so what we see then is that for communities with higher social vulnerability and greater negative um, impacts of changes in species available to them, we might prioritize our efforts to uh, support adaptation in those communities. Uh, whereas I do want to point out there are some communities that are projected to actually benefit from some of the changes that are occurring. And so Climate change isn't necessarily an across the board negative story for fisheries in this region. Um, so another part of our work has involved thinking about adaptation strategies that may be of interest and that may support future adjustments to the changes that are occurring in fisheries um, for fishermen and fishing communities. And for this work, we have focused on four sort of um, four pilot communities um, that provide some contrast in terms of their current fisheries to try to understand how they're thinking about adaptation to climate change as they look ahead. So our communities are Stonington, Maine, and New Bedford, Massachusetts, which are one northern and one uh, southern community that are really focused on single species. So in Stonington, lobster is 98% of the value of their fishery landings, and in New Bedford, scallops really dominate the landings there in terms of the value brought into that port. Portland, Maine, and Point Judith, Rhode Island are much more diverse ports with a number of different fisheries uh, contributing to the value of the, um, the landing in those ports. And so we conducted interviews with fishing industry stakeholders as well as other community members in these communities to understand how they're thinking about what potential strategies they're thinking about using as they either already adjust to some of the climate impacts or think about them in the future. And we heard a variety of different things from industry actions that are already being taken related to how they handle products to, um, for example, lobster, how they handle lobster and store it in the tanks on their boats to keep it well oxygenated, even if uh, temperatures are rising and that would typically result in depletion of oxygen in the tanks. Um, thinking about supply chain capacity and marketing initiatives to adjust to some of the fluxes in harvest that are associated with climate change. So these are actions that are already being taken within the industry broadly. We're also seeing harvesters on the water responding to changes and particularly one of the common strategies that was discussed was shifting their fishing locations. And as I described earlier, this is something we're already seeing play out in a number of fisheries. They're also shifting target species, and this is something fishermen have historically done over time. They've been really flexible in, um, they're trying to catch something that they're not seeing, adjusting to what they are seeing on the water. And this has, you know, become a bit harder in more recent years as we have managed fisheries differently to kind of control access to fisheries so that we can better control who's participating and the effort levels exerted on those stocks. But this is still a common a strategy that's commonly mentioned by fishermen as being really important to how they're thinking about the future. And then also diversifying their activities, whether that be in fisheries by diversifying the suite of species that they're targeting or into activities outside of wild harvest fishing. Aquaculture is one example, but there are many others to think about. And then 
I was also really surprised by how frequently the strategy of uh, potentially increasing value of the catch in a variety of ways and local seafood initiatives being really important to that, whether it's through direct sales or um, generally building up community capacity to support local seafood consumption and aligning consumption preferences with the species that are available to fishermen on the water. So one last part of this is thinking about which strategies might be most effective for buffering some of the impacts that we've, uh, that I talked about initially associated with shifting species. And in this, we really are trying to think about if you modify adaptive capacity by employing certain strategies, how does that change the overall relative vulnerability of a fishery in a certain community? Um, so we've done this by looking, I'm not gonna go into great details on this, uh, the methods here, but we've used economic models that can enable us to assess different strategies, particularly what if you optimize your mix of gear that you're using for fisheries at a certain port to take advantage of the, to best take advantage of the species that are available? What if you travel further to track the species you uh, have traditionally harvested? And what if you switch and fish on some of the new species that are coming in uh, as part of what you catch? So we've been able to look at the initial impacts of not adapting and then considering these three adaptation strategies to understand what the impacts alone might look like, as well as how much these strategies can buffer those impacts. So we can um, play this out for landed value. I believe this example comes from New Bedford. Um, I should have noted that in my title. But essentially with no adaptation, we are projecting a decline in the overall landed value of species in that port. Um, with one here being the current state, and then the bars representing what's possible according to the scenarios that we have modeled. So this is the impact scenario of not adapting and just absorbing the impact. And then if we look at different adaptation strategies, we can see how much they modify that impact. So you can see here, if you um, use a strategy of shifting the fishing area to track species and optimizing the gear mix for the species that are available, you can recover from that impact and then also adding in the potential for fishing on emerging species can actually set up a situation where you can do better than at present. And again, um, that's landed value. Profits don't recover as quickly or as thoroughly, but adaptation is still really important to the potential for um, recovering from the impacts alone rather than just absorbing them. Um, so I think the takeaway here is that the impacts can, the impacts vary across ports. For the four ports we looked at, we saw substantial impacts in some ports and very modest impacts in others. And effective adaptation measures are really important for recovering from that impact. Um, but the measures that make the most difference also vary from port to port. So it's really important to understand the local situation and think about the local context when evaluating adaptation options. So just a few insights to take away from this. Um, we do expect to see um, that future fisheries may look different from our present fisheries. The ways we adapt to this change will be really important for ensuring that we still maintain viable and productive fisheries in the future. Um, and adaptation is occurring and uh, fishermen and fishing communities are already thinking about ways that they will adapt and some of them are already taking certain measures, but there are a number of barriers that we need to overcome to sort of more fully enable adaptation for our fisheries in the region. And these aren't all within just the fishery management system. Good fisheries management is a really big part of this, but also thinking about industry efforts and community measures that are designed to support what fisheries will look like in the future is really increasingly important as well. Um, so just to sort of wrap up some summary points from across all of the talk, um, the Northeast Shelf we've seen is warming rapidly. That warming takes a variety of different effects in terms of playing out as a gradual trend, uh, shift in our seasonality, and then also changes in the frequency of heat waves we're experiencing here. The warming patterns are affecting species and fisheries in the region. Um, we 
talked quite a bit about cod and lobster, but we are also seeing these impacts play out in scallops and shrimp. Um, and while there may be some stories that are not optimistic, we do see a number of new species becoming more prevalent in the region as well. Uh, a couple of examples that came into the talk tonight were squid and black sea bass. And in this region, fishery, the fishing industry and communities really are on the front lines of feeling the impacts of climate change and needing to adapt to those. Um, so they are already responding in ways that they can to the situation and are thinking about and planning for longer term adaptation and measures that are needed to support um, more extensive adaptation options in the future. And really, as we face decisions for our fisheries and our fishing communities, we should be thinking about future conditions as we make those decisions because the uh, decisions often involve investments that last for many years and planning for the present may not actually reflect the plans that need to be in the place for the realities that will be coming, you know, 20 years down the road. So I want to close by acknowledging that I've had a number of excellent collaborators in all of this work. I'm not going to walk through them individually and acknowledging the many funding sources that have also contributed to the results I presented tonight. So with that, I would love to take questions and have a chance to talk a little bit further with you. Thank you. Kathy, thank you very much for that for that talk, we really appreciate your perspective on, on all the changes that are happening here in the Gulf of Maine. There are um, a handful of questions down here in the Q&A. Let, um, let me get started here at the top. This, the first question comes from, um, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, but um, Nelia Morea, uh, Morera. Uh, she says, I'm curious about how the models for cod and lobster were developed um, and against what they were tested. Are these models generated based on previous conditions in the Gulf of Maine? Uh, and then how are the interacting effects of different factors managed so they don't confound one another when trying to isolate, say, the effective temperature? Yeah, so that's a huge question. Um, I guess to keep the response simple, um, and I'm happy to go into greater detail offline. If you're interested, um, they, they were both developed based on past observations of the population and conditions here in the Gulf of Maine. And then we, we developed the model and we validate how it performs against the observations that we have. Um, so often using like a holdout set of observations to see if the model will reliably predict to the conditions for a period that wasn't factored into the model development process. And then once we feel like we have a, a model that is actually performing well, we can use the temperatures for the future to substitute them in for the temperatures historically to look at how the projections play out for the future. Um, sorry, what was the second? Oh, how do we tease apart different factors? Yes. So um, that is, we did that much more extensively in the lobster work than in the cod work. In the cod work, we could, uh, we really just focused on fishing and temperature. In the lobster work, we also considered things like um, uh, shell disease, right, predation. I can't remember all of the things that came into that. Obviously, the conservation measures and the management system and temperature, and I know I'm missing some things there. Um, but essentially, what we did in that work was sort of uh, hold everything constant and at an average level and then let the variable of interest vary so that we could look at its influence alone separate from the others. And then by playing through all of them, we could evaluate sort of the, um, the standalone effects of that one piece. And getting into interactions is much more complicated. And so in that work, we were really treating, like trying to understand the separate effect of each piece and how much it would have added to others rather than truly getting into all of the interactions that we could have played out there. I hope that's helpful as a start and uh, I'd be happy to share the papers with you or to talk through that more um, offline. Yeah, thank, thank you for the offer of carrying on conversations offline, Kathy. There, there may be others that, that um, may benefit from additional conversation. Um, 
And the next question comes from Donna Collins. Uh, and it's, what is the habitat relationship between the American lobster and Atlantic cod? Uh, historically, there were high cod populations and low lobster populations, but with overfishing and less cod, there seems to be more lobster surviving to adulthood in the Gulf of Maine area. So can you address overfishing as part of this change in species populations and how changing temperatures are connected? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. It certainly is something that's why we included predation as one of the factors in the um, in the lobster modeling work. Um, there has been obviously a decline in groundfish in this area, at, and then a subsequent increase in lobsters. And the decline of groundfish is particularly related to the history of overfishing. Um, but we have also seen, you know, many of those groundfish stocks start to recover and or they have recovered for a number of them, not for cod, um, as I just told you tonight, but for others, we have seen recovery. Um, but we do obviously think that, you know, there is an intersection between those and there is predation for, um, you know, adult cod preying on juvenile lobsters. And this is one thing that comes into um, sort of thinking about the future of lobster here as well, is that many of the Southern New England predators on lobster are more voracious than some of the predators here. And so one thing that hasn't been very well factored into some of the projections is that potential influence of predation by some of the species that are moving in. And black sea bass happens to be one of those species that we, you know, we sort of first, um, we're aware of the increase in black sea bass from lobstermen pulling it up in their lobster traps. And so there's obviously an interaction to be um, thinking about there. And we have a new project that we haven't really started work on yet to think about predation in some of these distribution models to try to factor that in as a potential influence that would drive where lobsters might be and how successful they might be there in the future. But um, it's just, that work is just developing. And I would say in general, a lot of work around climate impacts have been very focused on individual species and not these interactions between species. And I think that's a really important direction to address in future research. And we're starting to see more research kind of build in that direction, which is really exciting. Yes, yeah, so that's a good entree into this next question, perhaps, Kathy. Um, Peter Howard asks, any guesses about shifts that will be needed or not in the underlying methods and approaches in New England fisheries management as species compositions change? Well, that's a good question. So I think obviously um, it's really important for us to pay attention to some of the direct effects of temperature um, and other influences that are becoming more um, observed in the region. And, you know, we often don't incorporate these into our stock assessments. I think a lot of that is that we look at the long-term influence, whereas the influence has really been exacerbated in some of the more recent years. As I mentioned earlier, just how strong our warming trend has been for the past 15 years, even relative to the long-term. So capturing those direct effects is important um, where they are relevant and detectable in our fisheries management process. But then also, you know, our fishery management currently is very single species focused. Um, and there has been for many years now discussion of moving to more ecosystem based approaches. And I think those are starting to, um, how we would operationalize that is starting to be developed, but it hasn't been implemented in an operational way in our fishery management system yet. And so moving toward ecosystem based approaches would enable us to think about um, groups of species or interactions between species better. Right now we kind of bring that in on the side as like ancillary information from ecosystem assessments to think about as you're looking at stock assessment information and planning for, you know, how to manage the stock, but it's not quantitatively incorporated in our assessments yet. Some, some are starting to bring in temperature, but not really these indirect effects and species interactions. And I think moving more toward an ecosystem-based approach will be really important um, for capturing some of those influences. Sure. And I was, I was curious during your talk, it, it seemed like the, the temperature numbers were sea surface temperatures, but with, with lobsters, I assume it's bottom water temperatures that would be perhaps the most relevant. Yeah, we actually, um, we have used 
see surface temperature for a lot of our work because it's really strongly correlated to bottom temperatures. So in the Gulf of Maine, the thresholds obviously would be different if you're looking at absolute temperature, but for the work that I showed you tonight, this is all built on relationships. So that is the absolute number is not going to alter the model. It's really the relationship and the pattern. And so in the Gulf of Maine, aside from our three really deep basins uh, and the deepest parts of those basins, there's a really strong correlation between surface and bottom temperatures. But because everyone asks this question, and particularly for our climate adaptation work where we're working with fishery stakeholders, um, we are now rebuilding a lot of our models with bottom temperature in them because it's just um, it's just really hard to, you know, lobstermen and fishermen are out there on the water and they're thinking about bottom temperatures. And so to connect with the way they're thinking about the system, no matter what we see scientifically in terms of the correlations and how they might affect the models, we need to be more aligned with how they think about the system. So we're actually rebuilding um, our whole suite of distribution models right now, and we're bringing in bottom temperature as well as salinity because this is something that's routinely come up uh, in our conversations with fishermen in the area. So it's good to have those dialogues and those collaborations. Great, thanks for that. Um, there's a question from uh, Mike Sigler, who I think he may be with the Integrated Ecosystems class. Uh, this question comes, uh, do you apply your model forecast to understand climate effects on place-based foragers, such as colonial terns or seals, two topics that are being studied in that class? Um, we haven't in a, in a like really formal way yet. I have a couple of people in my lab who are really seabird people at heart and um, or bird people at heart. One is definitely seabirds and one is any bird. Um, so they have sort of loosely woven some of the changes that we've seen into thinking about what might be going on with seabirds and other animals in the region, um, you know, but not not in any of our formal modeling work yet, um, but that would be a great direction to think about building some collaborations and figuring out how our work could be useful. And I mentioned earlier, the work we'll be doing around um, incorporating predation into the lobster models. So that will mean we need to get to um, sort of a size a size specific perspective on some of these changes. So predation is obviously influenced by size. So we need to separate the species into size classes. And I think that will also make this work or doing that across the species that are relevant to birds would make this work much more relevant to some of the um, bird colonies and feeding needs as well. So steps in that direction, but not, not sure. really work. Those. Yes. Uh, one more question from Mike in his class. Uh, simply, what, why more emerging species north of Cape Cod? Oh, I think um, only because they're already south of Cape Cod. So as I mentioned, they will not be, we, we won't be losing them there. But now we're getting temperatures into a range where they can also be comfortable and productive here in the Gulf of Maine. So. Um, we just don't have, you know, many options of things coming in to uh, a lot of our southern New England communities. We, I actually think Point Judith is a really interesting example because they have already shifted from groundfish to lobster and now to squid as a huge um, component of what they're catching in Point Judith. So they have been through these changes that have tracked shifts in the ecosystem. And what I see in Point Judith and New Bedford for our focus communities there is that their fisheries over time have already incorporated, they've already been through the process of shifting species and how it affects their fisheries. And they've already incorporated those species. And so now we're just seeing kind of the lagged effect of those species coming into the Gulf of Maine. Um, I hope that's somewhat helpful. Sure, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so we've, we're at that 8.30 hour, which is where we would traditionally stop this talk. I would, wouldn't mind trying to squeeze in one more question, if you don't mind, from the ecology and marine environment class, which comes via Jed Sparks. Um, do you expect rising temperature in the Gulf of Maine to increase disease in lobster as it has in Long Island Sound and other places? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I do. I In 2012, we weren't anywhere near the disease prevalence rates of southern New England, but even just in that one year of really warm temperatures, we saw an increase in the observed rate of lobster shell disease. And obviously, disease is something that's really important for a number of other fisheries as well. So, um, aquaculture, uh, some of the path or some of the diseases that can affect the either success of those species and their survival and growth, um, as well as potential pathogens that can affect human uh, health. And if they consume those products, we're seeing increases on both of those fronts as well in a variety of different diseases and pathogens. So that's a great question. Great. Well, well, Kathy, thank you, thank you very, very much for for spending an hour with us this evening. We're uh, past that eight thirty hour now, so I, I will bring the the rock talk this evening to a close. But please, I ask everyone to join in and thanking Kathy for uh, spending some time with us tonight, sharing your 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 breadth of knowledge on fisheries here in the Gulf of Maine. We really appreciate your perspective and your sharing of the information that you did tonight. So thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Everybody. All right. And we'll, we'll look forward to maybe getting you out on Appledore next summer, perhaps. I will totally take you up on that. Thanks. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Take care. I hope you all have a very good evening. Um, and we'll look forward to seeing you all next week, perhaps. Take care. Good night.